Welcome to Chemistry at Huntington High School. I'm Brian Brown, and today we'll be looking at our second uh, set of notes dealing with solutions. Today we'll be looking at what is in 15.3 in our book, which deals with different types of mixtures. Now, you may recall from first semester, there's two different types of mixtures, heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures. Now, a heterogeneous mixture is when the composition is not the same throughout, so they're unevenly mixed together. Now, one way in which this can happen in a solution-like situation is when we have what's called a suspension. Now, a suspension is a mixture, just like a solution is a mixture, but one fundamental, really important difference is that the suspension has particles that are so large that they settle out. So literally, the differences in density in the particles will become relevant, and one will sink and the other will float in the other. And what we have are basically then suspended particles. As long as we're shaping, shaking it, those particles that had separated out and settled or rose to the top, they can be dispersed throughout. But as soon as we stop shaking it, those suspended particles are going to separate out and we truly have a heterogeneous mixture. Now it's only going to stay mixed and look like it's homogeneous while we're shaking it. But when we stop and we give a little bit of time, it will clearly end up separating out. Now, because they're larger particles, another thing we can often do is we can pass it through filter paper and we can see if there's any large particles that get filtered out. If they do, then we knew we had a suspension. Now, one of the things, and you've got to see this to really understand thoroughly what a Tyndall effect is, but it is true that suspensions will display a positive Tyndall effect, which is a visible scattering of light caused by the reflection of light off the particles when it strikes it. Now, normally when light moves through a medium like the air around us, we don't really see the light as it's moving through the air. We only see it when it strikes an object large enough to reflect the light. So if you're walking through the woods, there's sunlight streaming through the air. Well, that sunlight is going to go straight from the source, the sun, to whatever it strikes on Earth. And you're not going to see the light in between unless there's particles suspended in the air that allow us to actually see the beams of light as they're moving through the air. And in this case, when you're moving through a forest, there's tons of little suspended particles of dirt and pollen and other things that are up inside the air. So as the light is moving through, you can actually see the beams of light as those particles in air that are so large that they're only suspended up in air until they fall down to the forest floor, uh, they're going to scatter the light as it moves through, and we can actually see the beams of light. So this is an example of what I mean by a positive Tyndall. You can clearly see the light beams as it's moving through the air when it strikes large particles that are suspended up inside the air. Now, where the light is not at, I don't really see those particles up in the air. But where that strong, intense beam of light hits, it reflects off the particles and I see the light beam. So light can't be seen and left, it reflects off those particles that are in the air. Now compared to a solution, which are very, very small particles, the suspended particles are significantly larger, large enough to scatter light and therefore see the beam. Now we'll see that later when we're looking at in a you know, water mixture type situation. Now the second type of mixture that we're going to look at is called a colloid. It's a mixture with intermediate sized particles that are small enough that the moving water molecules actually keep them stirred up. Now that would be if water was our uh, dispersing medium. Um, we can't really say dissolving because we didn't make a solution when we made a colloid, but you do have two things mixed together. One's going to be there in greater quantity and the other gets mixed up in that one. Well if it is water as that solvent-like substance that the particles get mixed up in, um, then you're going to see uh, the scattering of light as it goes through it. So it looks to the naked eye like it's homogeneous because it stays mixed up. The particles don't settle out and won't filter out because they are small enough to go through filter paper. But it is true that it would be large enough to scatter light that goes through it. So intense light shining through a colloid, you will see the light reflect off those intermediate sized particles and you will actually get a positive Tyndall effect. So like with suspensions, you can actually see the light as it's moving through the medium because there are big enough particles that visibly reflect the light. So you do get a positive Tyndall. But unlike a suspension, which only looks homogeneous when you're shaking it, colloids are tricky because to the naked eye, they're going to look homogeneous. And even if you try and filter it or let it sit there for a while, the particles aren't going to settle out and they aren't going to filter out because they're small enough to go through the filter paper. And really what's happening on a particle level is even though they're more dense in the water and they should be sinking to the bottom, because water is in constant random motion, as long as those particles aren't too big, the random movements of the water molecules are going to keep those particles stirred up. Now, 
on the to the naked eye, it may look like it's uniformly mixed, but milk is an example of a colloid because when we look at it at the particle level under intense magnification, we can truly see that the flat globules are not truly uniformly mixed. So it has been made to look homogeneous. It's been made in its colloidal form because what they do is they break up those fat molecules into small enough chunks that even though they truly aren't uniform, and we can see that under magnification, they do stay mixed up because of the random motions of the water molecules inside the milk. So it's made to become looking like it's homogeneous, which is why that process of breaking up the milk fats into small enough little chunks that they stay stirred up and don't separate out is known as homogenized milk. It looks to the naked eye homogenous, but if you look at it under a microscope, you can see it really is not uniformly mixed together. It truly is homogeneous. But the process of homogenation with milk is to make it appear homogeneous, to make it basically a colloid or a colloidal substance. Now, there's lots of colloids in everyday life because we have many, many mixtures in everyday life that are convenient and useful to us. Shaving cream and styrofoam and fog or mist, milk, mayonnaise, butter, cream, jello, um, dust, smoke. There's lots of different things that are actually colloidal substances. We have a dispersed particle in a dispersing medium, and they're not really dissolving, so they're not breaking up until very, very small pieces. They're breaking up into intermediate sized pieces that are small enough that the motions of the dispersing medium keeps them mixed up, and it appears homogeneous even though it's really not. So colloidal substances are actually really important in everyday life because we don't want to have to stir up our milk. We don't want to have to stir up medicines and so forth. Now, sometimes there's suspensions and we have to. And any medicine that reads stir before using is a suspension. But there are many, many products that people just don't want to have to shake up and stir. Well, if we make them colloidal, make the dispersing medium motions of the particles, mix up those small enough dispersed particles, it will stay relatively evenly mixed up, even though it's truly not homogeneous. Now, the last type of mixture is our true homogeneous mixture, when the particles are very small and truly uniformly mixed up. And that's another name for solutions. So when we talk about solutions, the mix between solute and solvent, yes, these are truly homogeneous substances. They have a solute, which is the dissolved substance, which is, remember, the more important way to look at this is the substance that's there in lesser quantity. And then you have the solvent, which is the dissolving agent, which is always going to be the substance there in greater quantity. When solute comes together with solvent and gets dispersed and you make a uniform mixture, then you have a homogeneous mixture or a solution. And really, these dissolved particles of solute are so small, they can't be seen even at high magnification and they don't reflect visible light. So you're not going to see with a beam of light as it travels through a solution. So in a true solution, if you pass an intense beam of light through it, it's going to go right through the liquid, and it won't leave a beam that you can see when you have a positive Tyndall. Now, I want to make sure you see what that looks like with you know liquid mixtures. What I have here is a substance that clearly has no particles that have settled out, so it is not a suspension. But when you pass the beam of light, you can only see it going through the beaker on the left and not the beaker on the right. So that's an example of a positive Tyndall. And in our other beaker, we have a negative Tyndall. So the one on the left must be the colloidal substance, doesn't settle out, but it has a positive Tyndall. And the one on the right must be a solution, doesn't settle out, and it has a negative Tyndall. So the dissolved particles are truly uniformly mixed together and very, very, very small in our solution. So left is colloid, right has to be a solution. Now, to sum up and review what we've looked at here, let's look at it from these various. Does it settle out, particle size, and so forth? So let's look at these various categories. So first off, settle out, yeah, suspension does settle out, but colloids and solutions will not. So that's something that separates a solution from the other two. In terms of actual particle size, if we could look at the particle level and see, we'd see that the suspended particles are the largest, the solutions are the smallest, and the colloids are intermediate. They're somewhere in between. And what happens is when we pass light through them, we will see the beam of light in a suspension and a colloid, but not a solution. The particles in a solution are too small to visibly scatter the light. So anything that looks a little bit cloudy to the naked eye chances are it's a colloid. And if it looks a little bit cloudy in the naked eye and you let it sit for a while and you see particles settling out, then you know it's a suspension. 
And remember, two of these are actually heterogeneous, and only one of them is actually a homogeneous mixture, and that's the solution. So that's an overview of what you really should understand about mixtures for the upcoming test. Now, next thing we're going to get into is a tiny bit into Chapter 16. So we're going to do just a little, little bit of Chapter 16 here. Now, one of the ways that we have of looking at how much we can dissolve in a substance is referred to as the solubility. It's the max amount of solute that can be dissolved in a given amount of solvent at a given temperature. So it is really how much solute in how much solvent at a specific temperature. Now, the reason why we have to specify temperatures is because most substances that are solid that dissolve in water will dissolve to different degrees based upon the temperature. So change the temperature, you change the solubility. In other words, you're changing how much solute can be dissolved in a given amount of solvent. Now, we classify solutions into three different types of solutions. One is when we can dissolve more solute. Anytime we have a solution that is not full of solute at that temperature, in other words, we can dissolve more, then we have what's considered an unsaturated solution. So unsaturated literally means not full. We can dissolve more. Now, when we are full, then we've got a saturated solution. So no more solute can be dissolved at that temperature. In other words, we're full. We can't dissolve anymore. Well, on the surface, it would seem that we're done. We're either not full or we're full. But for solutions, there is a very rare, unstable type of situation that can sometimes exist with certain types of solutes. Sugar is an example of a substance will do this. You can actually set up a situation where you have more sugar dissolved at a temperature than you're supposed to have. And there are a number of other solids besides sugar that will do that in water. And what we're talking about is supersaturation. Supersaturation means we are more than full. So we have more dissolved than should be at a given temperature. Now, how does this actually happen? Well, it's a very specific situation. If we have a solid that under high temperature is much more soluble, we can, in a given amount of water, dissolve a large quantity of that solute if we get it hot enough, up by the boiling point of water. Now, as it cools off, the solubility is going to drop, and we're not supposed to have as much dissolved. But when we form a solution, the water molecules hydrate whatever it is we're dissolving, and they actually stabilize the solution, and they prevent the things from reassociating with each other, and therefore recrystallizing and coming back out of solution. So if we have an unsaturated solution at a very high temperature with a lot dissolved in it, so we're close to saturation but not quite there, when we cool it off, we should reach a saturated solution and the solid particle should recrystallize. But in many situations, the water stabilizes the solution enough and the attraction of the particles is weak enough that even though it's not supposed to be dissolved, it'll stay dissolved until we spark the recrystallization. And that's how we end up making a supersaturated solution. So it's made in one very specific way. You heat it up to increase the solubility, dissolve a bunch, and then slowly cool it off. And remember, it has to be completely dissolved. If there's any seed crystal sitting on the bottom, that will be sites of recrystallization, and all of the stuff will come back out of solution. But there are a number of different substances that will stay dissolved even though they're not supposed to. And it's a very unstable situation. So if we drop in a seed crystal of whatever we dissolve, that'll give it a site of recrystallization, and the other stuff will come out of solution. And sometimes it's so unstable that we can just shake it, and it'll come out of solution. So on a particle level, what I want to finish with here are a couple of diagrams, just so you get on a particle level what we've been talking about with these types of solutions. If we have an ionic compound, cations and anions, dissolved in water, we've talked about this process before, and this is what it looks like on the particle level after it's all dissolved. Would this be a saturated or an unsaturated solution? Well, if you look, we have plenty of water molecules that are not involved in dissolving here. They are all over the place. So we've got free water molecules that can go and pull more ions off the crystal and dissolve more. So in this particular picture, we know it's unsaturated because we have water molecules that are free to go dissolve. But when we look at this picture, is it saturated or unsaturated? Well, I don't have any clear evidence that there's any water molecules that aren't involved in hydration. So I would class this as a satur classify this as a saturated solution. And that's because there's just no visual evidence that there's water molecules free to go dissolve more. 
So it looks to me like it's completely dissolved. Now we can't really on a particle level tell a saturated from a supersaturated unless we really knew how many molecules of water we should see per dissolved particle. So we don't really get to that level. And that ends our notes for the second part of our solutions chapters.